while I get this fixed. So hi guys, um, is it okay, the volume, everything is working fine? Perfect. Um, so I know that the title of my talk doesn't really give away too much. So I would like to start with a few questions in order to get to know you a little bit better and set up the stage. So how many of you have heard of skydiving before, except now? Okay, great. Um, the second question would be, how many of you thought this is an item worth crossing off your bucket list? So if it's something that you thought it would be good to try at least once while you're on Earth, please keep your hands up. Quite a few hands, nice. And how many of you did actually get to try skydiving? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, six with me, seven, okay. Well, by now you might have guessed that my talk is gonna have something to do with skydiving, but you might all be wondering why. From the exercise that we've just been through, you might have noticed that although the majority of us think that skydiving is a cool thing to try, only a handful of us have got to experience this until this point. And that got me wondering, why? Why is it that, although we consider this to be such a collectivity, not more of us get the courage to try it? Well, in preparation for today's talk, I was, of course, as a diligent speaker, scouting, you know, for talks on skydiving in, on the internet, searching, you know, far and wide, and I've looked at a few of them, and I noticed that they have a few things in common. First of all, regardless of, you know, who's doing the talk, from Hollywood superstars that are describing their first tandem experience to super experienced athletes with thousands of jumps under their belts, they all have a few things that they touch upon. I'm sorry. <clears throat> so, um, the first thing is that they all describe this as an exhilarating experience, a super fun thing to do. And the second thing is that they all talk about the fear factor that I'm going to get into more details in about a second. So, mentioning this fear factor, um, although most, uh, most of you have heard of skydiving, we learned that only a handful of us tried to experience this until now, right? Well, although only a handful experienced skydiving, I am pretty sure that every single one of us present here today has experienced the fear that I'm going to talk about. Um, let me give you an example. So, basically, when you are sure that you're going to skydive, your brain quickly does the math for you. So, so if we are going to take, um, for example, an object with the rough, you know, um, characteristics of this body that I find myself trapped in, and we throw it off of a cliff or out of a plane, taking into account some small details such as, I don't know, let's say the weather conditions and the laws of physics, you have approximately kind of um, uh, kind of a hundred percent chances to die. <laughs> that is, of course, unless you have a working parachute attached to your back, but your brain doesn't really want to take that little detail into account, does it? Um, this fear is coming from a really natural, um, it's a really natural reaction, um, and that is also the reaction that makes a lot of people think of, if not do, what I'm about to describe to you. So imagine that you've learned that you're going to skydive, right? And it's going to happen on Friday. Now your brain did the math for you because the real brain is really smart and quick to do that math, right? You're waiting, but by the time it's Friday and you get up on the plane and you get to the door and you get you know, to look out, you and your body already knows exactly what the outcome of that experience is going to be, right? 100%, you're gonna die. So what a lot of people try to do is at the last second, right before they're getting out of the plane, they try to grab onto the door of the plane as hard as they can in an attempt to do something that we're all hardwired to do, survive. Um, that is why a lot of instructors when they do the jump, although they do agree with their passenger to count to three before exiting, right, one, two, three, let's go, they prefer to jump at two, surprising their passenger because then they manage to avoid that moment of clinging on to the door of the plane that could create complications on the fall. But 
What happens if you don't have someone to push you out at two? What happens if you find yourself all alone needing to take that jump with nobody around you to support you or give you the care that you need? Well, for the past few years, skydiving has been a big part of my life. So the lessons that I'm about to share with you today are extracted from my experience and from observations that I've made while practicing this sport. So, without further ado, let's, let's get right into it. Um, I mentioned earlier, you know, that you might have to face, you know, this challenge of jumping out, taking the leap on your own, right? Um, this can be a really incredible task to achieve, right? It might seem impossible at first. So that is why my first advice for you would be to take that big dream and split it. Break it down into small steps that you can actually take. Break it into small steps that are, you know, as tiny as it would be super comfortable for you to take. For example, in my case, my first step was taking my car and driving to the local skydiving club. Yes, I know it might come as a shock, but there are that many skydiving clubs around, so you have a local skydiving club around you. Um, and watch others skydive. Just by sitting there and watching the students getting prepared for their first jumps, one after the other, you know, all excited and all a little bit nervous, but all so happy and excited, so empowered as they landed safely, one after the other. One, two, three, 10, 20, 30. Okay, if all these guys can do it, so could I, right? That was for sure an encouragement. Well, that is why I am presenting you the first piece of advice, which would be take your dream and split it into small, manageable tasks. It is not enough to, for them to be small. I would use maybe as an analogy taking baby steps. Why? Well, babies on one hand take small, tiny steps, but at the same time, they're discovering the world as they go. So every step that they take is going to be filled with wonder, which is also something that you guys should and I also try all the time to do because taking a lot of tiny steps can get boring in a really short time. But making sure that you have something to discover with every step will definitely help you a long way. So now that we've established that you're taking your small steps and you are you know, one step closer towards achieving your dream, um, you might be feeling a little bit, I don't know, Mm, lost, let's say. You don't know what the next step is going to, to be. Well, it's definitely sure that we will all find ourselves in uncomfortable situations at some point. Going back to my example with skydiving, you know, I've been there, um, watched other skydives, decided that I wanted to do it, but that was just the first step. Then I had to go and do a lot of training, and you know, go through exams, both on ground, go through simulations. Um, all those were super tiny steps that got me to a point where I was sitting together with four of my friends just in a plane, all new students waiting to go and do our first jump. And believe me, sitting in a small, small plane, you have to be crunched with your knees next to your chest and be there for about 15 minutes. Now, when you are with your knees to your chest for about 15 minutes, nature and gravity can play a really nasty trick on you. I don't know if you know where I'm going with this, but then I'll try to be a bit more explicit. You're sitting there, and you're waiting for your climb, right? Um, you're a bit excited and also a little bit nervous. What I'm about to describe to you, it's happening mostly due to the change in air pressure. But, um, affected also by your diet and by the level of anxiety that you might have in that day, you will maybe be surprised that, you know, without even you noticing, realize that you just committed an air pollution crime. That's really nice. If you imagine that the plane is really, really small, and if you're unlucky enough to go through this experience at the beginning of your climb, you have to sit there for 15 minutes knowing that everybody else in that plane knows exactly what you've been up to. It's embarrassing. Um, it's really hard to deal with in the beginning. 
But, you know, even if you're not the perpetrator, it's still not going to be the comfiest ride of your life. The point that I'm trying to make here is that we are all going to be going through uncomfortable situations at some point in our lives. The important lesson to take from here is that instead of regarding uncomfortable situations or discomfort as um, something bad, you should look at it as an indication of progress. Because when you get out of your comfort bubble, you're actually going towards something better. You're making progress, you're moving. So that is a good sign. That is why my second advice for you guys would be to regard this feeling of discomfort as a sign of progress and use it in order to, uh, to fuel you on your journey and not really focus on the first um, feelings and emotions that come attached to it because that will clutter your mind and will take you away from, you know, take your focus away from, from the journey that you're on. Um, in my case, of course, you know, with time, I learned to realize that that is just a natural reaction and we all have to go through it. Everybody, you know, all the experienced skydivers know that already, so they always laugh when they see the embarrassment of, you know, on the faces of, of newcomers. But, you know, with time, you learn to, to deal with it. Moving on, now you've been, you know, taking baby steps. You learn that you have to regard discomfort as a sign of progress. So you are really close to achieving your your goal, right? There is, though, one more step before taking that leap. And here I would like to take a moment to think a little bit of another alumni of, uh, of the Queen's University, Elon Musk. I guess you guys are familiar with him, right? Yes. So how many mocked his targets and how many laughed at his ambitions? Take Tesla, for example. Did he care? Well, we don't really know. We could assume he didn't. But maybe even if he did, his belief in himself was stronger. So that is why my last piece of advice to you is that when you find yourself on a solitary journey, you should always remember to believe in yourself like nobody else can. It is amazing and really great if you manage to surround yourself with friends and family that can bring you support but, you know, once you are at the door of the plane waiting to jump or sitting all alone in front of your tough exam or waiting to get into the room where you are about to get interviewed, you always have to remember to believe in yourself like nobody else can. Um, now, what could you do with all this advice that, that I gave you, right? Um, we've talked about taking small steps, we've talked about being okay with feeling uncomfortable, being okay with the feeling of discomfort, and also about believing in yourself like nobody else can. Well, what I hope that you take from tonight is that next time when you find yourself um, in front of your big challenge, in front of your leap. And as I said, we're in the middle of the midterm season, right? So it might be a tough exam waiting around the corner. It might be a tough interview that you're about to get into. Or, I don't know, maybe a, a skydive. Regardless of what it is, if you break it down into small steps sprinkled with wonder, Remember to be okay with the feeling of discomfort by regarding it as an indication of progress. And believe in yourself like nobody else can. I promise you, it will be worth the try. Thank you.